Hello everyone, Benny here, and in this video we're going to be talking about registers and we're going to be talking about ROM. For anyone who happens to be new to the series, this series is, as the title implies, explaining how Minecraft computers work. It is designed to go along with my Building Minecraft Computer Tutorial series. However, you do not need to watch that series to understand the series. This is its own independent series. However, the only overlap that is there is if I'm referencing video numbers, then that is referring to videos in that series, the Building Minecraft Computer Tutorial series, and not this series. So now that that's all out of the way, let us begin. So now, in the last video in this series, I talked about how I've talked well. I talked all about RAM. I talked about how RAM was based on buses, and how those buses were like, like city buses, and how all the various memory locations in RAM were like bus stops, where information off traveling on the buses could get off n at any of the RAM locations, and then they, it could get on onto other buses, and then travel to wherever they wanted in the computer using those buses. But when we added registers, we did something different. Just before the e information got to the bus where it would be going to the RAM, where it could get off all the bus stops for all the RAM, it did a little bit of this interesting little turn, and where it basically went all the way back to the start, pretty much, all the way under the arithmetic logic unit, and then straight into the inputs to the ALU. So that's a little bit of an interesting thing to do, and that's part of the bus for the register. And really, for the as far as the register is concerned. It's a lot less like a bus, and a lot more like a taxi. The information sort of gets in and tells the taxi driver, I'm going to the AOU, and I'm going to be input whatever. And the taxi driver says, OK, uh, and takes him straight there. No need to go through all these silly bus stops. He has to get off onto some bus stop, and get on another bus stop, and then go through all the rest of the bus stops on the way to finally getting back to the inputs. He just hops in a taxi, taxi takes him straight there. And that's what the register lets us do. It lets us take information straight out of the outputs of the AOU, send it straight back there. It's right so registers, when you're sending something to a register, you're sending it to a place with a very specific destination in mind. So uh, the reason you put in a register is any location where you'd have some information traveling from point A to point B excessively frequently, like, for example, the sending from the output of the AOU back to the input of the AOU, <laughs> that's well, an ideal location to put a register system, because you can just have the information go straight back, and it's really fast. At the same time, though, you don't really want to rely entirely on registers, because, I mean, come on. Imagine the city if you just had everybody taking a taxi everywhere. There were no more buses, there were no cars, there were no pedestrians. Everyone rode in a taxi. If you wanted to be efficient, you would need a lot of taxis. And that, would, that wouldn't be ideal. So, that's why we have both the bus system and the taxi system. The RAM and the register. So, that's the first function of the register, but as you hopefully noticed, the registers in the end are just memory. So, the at is something that should, that is worthy of being taking note of. All of this, this whole time, we're just still talking about a little bit of busing, yes, and memory. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if something gets off in a register location, we said that, well, when you got off in RAM, that was like getting off at a bus stop. So you were just go, went to the new bus stop and waited for the next bus, so you could get on that bus and go on. But when you're getting off at a register location, it's a bit different. Because, I mean, if you're taking a taxi, generally when you get out of a taxi, you're at the final place you want to be. A and that same holds true here. When you get off from the register location, the information is exactly where it wants to be. It's at the ALU. The ALU is like its office building or something. Maybe it's its home. So it's just like, yeah, and it goes straight in, does all whatever work it needs to do, and then just gets out, goes to the output. In fact, it's a lot like an office bu building because once it's done all its work, 
and it's waiting. For, it's just sitting here waiting for the day to be over, because uh, it's done everything it needs to do. And that's exactly what happens with this information too. It just goes through the LU, ends up at the two outputs with the muxer. And so that's what happens. It, it ends up going out of here, going through here, doing all its tasks, and then ending up waiting for the muxer to say, "All right, you can go now." So, that's, and then of course we can just power the muxer to say, okay, now it's time to go. But, y you get the idea. So that's basically how registers work. And, and that's, I think, a decent explanation in terms of analogy of how registers work. So, let's get into more of the computing end of things. Because after all, this is a computer, we need to know how it works in computing, or otherwise it's completely useless. So first off, why on earth do we need this? Well, first off, again, it's a lot easier if you have information that's tr frequently traveling from one point to another to just have sort of a shortcut in the system to get it there faster. That's the first purpose of a register. Second purpose of a register. You can have all the processing done beforehand. If I was to do everything out of RAM, when it loaded the information, that was the first time it could process it. And you, that might not make sense, but think of it like this. Try doing 2 plus 2 in your head. Hopefully you came up with 4. Now, try doing x plus x. Anyone who's done any algebra uh, or any decently middle to high level mathematics at all would say, well, that can't be done because you don't know the value of x. As until I tell you the value of x is 2 or 4 or whatever the x is, you can't do that equation because you don't know the value. And this is a computer, it's exactly the same. It can't process information it doesn't have. So it would have to wait for the information to come from RAM, and then the computer would have to wait for it to process before it could continue. So not only does it take extra time in transportation, it takes extra time in processing. Whereas if you send it through a register, it already has all the information processing done by the time it needs it. So those are really the two big advantages of registers. So, let's I guess we can see some of this in motion then. So, we've done some magic amount of computing. We've gotten the number 5. So, now it, it is going along the bus to memory, but it's also travel underneath and gone into the land of registers, where it's taken the taxi, it's gone here, and you can say, great, I want it to go to input A. Then it goes in, does all its stuff, and as it turns out, there's nothing else t to do because there's no other numbers, so it just goes straight through the building and comes out the other end, and I can just power either of these wires and say, okay, it's okay to leave now. And then it leaves, exactly as it was because nothing else was there, as it turns out. So. Now let's get a 2. Let's say there's this 2 that comes out for some reason. And we want on say, 2 takes a taxi and says, okay, I'm going to the ALU's input B. And that taxi driver says, okay, great. He sent, takes him there and drops him off. And then he, he gets to the ALU, does, goes through, does all his work, and he's waiting there to get out. So now I can say, okay, time to leave. And we get a 7 now because it's done all the processing. We get a 7. And. We can also distract it, so we can do, do, do all the processing, we get a free. Because 5 minus 2, guess what? It's free. So, that's uh, hopefully explained how everything always works to you. Hopefully you have a decent understanding of registers, why they're useful, why we need them, or wh whatever your feelings are about around them. So yeah, and again, remember, in the end, there are different types of memory, they have different types of advantages, but again, it's all memory. So, now, let's talk about ROM. <coughs> After my throat clears, because my throat is going to clog up for some reason. Now, in video 10, I went over how to build ROM. And I did not finish on camera, because I felt that you had sufficient knowledge to finish it. So I did go ahead and finish the ROM off camera. This is what it looks like. And here it is. So ROM is a lot like RAM. You, it has the control system, the reading command, 
I'm sorry, I'm back. This ROM is a lot like RAM because it has a control system. You have the uh, read command, you have the write command, but you just have the read command in this case. And you could say it's sort of like the opposite of registers because RAM has a read and write command, ROM just has a read command, and registers just have the write command. So they're sort of like the opposite of one another. So what on earth is ROM like? Well, we, you went over how the all the RAM looks like the busing system, and the registers work like the taxi system. So what's this? Well, these are sort of still part of the busing system because they're going on to the bus. But these are more like those old ladies who just sit there at the bus stop, no, no reason, not really going anywhere particular most of the time. No one really knows wh wh where they came from or what they're doing. They're just sort of there. Of course, in the case of ROM, we do know what it's doing, usually, sometimes, on occasion, but that, that's what it is. It's sort of just there. No, no one, they never come from anywhere. That's the key thing here. Because in RAM, you have a clear place it comes from. It comes from the writing bus. Right there, gets off the bus, sitting at the stop, and then gets back on. ROM, no one knows where it comes from. It just, it's just sort of, you find it there, it's just there. So, the way ROM works is the programmer, or sometimes the user, would have to manually go inside the computer, in our case, and then input whatever value they want the ROM to have, like 5. So, it's the old lady that's just sitting at the bus stop, no one knows where it is, and you can tell her, hey, her bus, is, her bus has arrived, and she gets on. And then, just because all those old ladies are like that, even when the bus leaves, She's still there somehow. It, and the only way to get rid of her is to come in yourself and then get rid of her on your own. Because often no one understands her. She's she's just there. So that's sort of what ROM is. It's just information that's persistent. It stays exactly as it is. And so why on earth? would we want information that never ever changes. It might seem a little odd first, but let me pick put you in an example of more advanced computing. Let's say we were building a computer that could pr simulate the universe. If we were building something like that, we could have all these things set up just like the universe is. There'd be an Earth, there'd be full of people, cities, life, and we have the solar system, we have the galaxies, we'd have all outer space, we'd have everything going on, everything would be going good, everything would be happy, everything would be just fine. Until one day someone comes along and says, you know, I'm bored of Earth orbiting the sun. We always orbit the sun. Let's orbit Neptune. Let's be rebellious against something, against our computer program that's simulating the universe. Well, if let's just stop and think a moment. What do you think's going to happen if the Earth suddenly decided to start orbiting Neptune? Very, very bad things start happening. You can start having interplanetary collisions. You can have start having things falling into the sun. You can have all sorts of really, really bad things happening. Just because that one person decided to change that one thing that really shouldn't be changed. So, that's sort of what ROM is. With information that's sort of just, it's never changed. And, if you want a more computing example of why that would, what, how that would be useful, think of something that's always constant, like pi, for example. Pi, you never really want to change pi. It, you always want to do because I mean pi never changes. It's always three point one four one five nine and two five eight three something three five nine or something. I'm my knowledge of the digits of pi are swindling. I'm not entirely sure at all if those last six digits were correct, but <laughs> it, it's it's some really complicated decimal number in any case. And that number never ever changes. So, you, at the end of the day, you don't really want to overwrite pi because pi is always the same. 
So if you had Pi chilling at bus stop 1, you could say, hey, hey, get off. And it would get off and would go to his stuff, but, and Pi would still be here, but you could also say, have, have a couple people call, or information arrive and say, alright, I want this information to get off at bus stop 1. You, and you know what information does when it arrives at a bus stop and there's something already there? It kicks it out. So, we'd lose Pi and we'd get these people. Every time we were trying to get Pi, then, well, we'd be getting these sort of odd new information pieces, and then all, all of our calculations would be wrong. So, that's, that's why these things are actually useful sometimes, because sometimes there's some value that you don't want to change. S and that's basically how ROM works. And we, right now we do have four pieces of ROM. If you were wondering, we will not need these four pieces of ROM. In fact, we're going to convert two of them in later videos into different use inputs into memory. And we'll show you that when we get to it. But that's basically how ROM works and registers work. So if you want to know more about how the ROM works and how to build it, that's all in video 10. If you want to know how the registers work, how to build it, well, we build the registers in video 9. They're D flip flops. You learn how to build oh, this design of a D flip flop in video 7. If you want how they how D flip flops or memory in general works, that's all in video 6. So, that's all the information for everyone, and I'll, I'll be seeing you next time. Thank you. See y'all later.